Hello, I'm Rahul with Team 22105 Runtime Terror, and their robot here has lots of mechanical complexities with this pocketed telescopic box tube extension, a level 3 hang using a drivetrain power takeoff, and a very simple intake allowing them to achieve really high, really low sample cycle times. Learn more on Behind the Box. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Judica Robotics offers durable, polished, and anodized aluminum channels now available in several different color options to customize your robot at studica.com slash robots. No rough edges and a versatile hole pattern allow for positioning at multiple angles. Teams in the U.S., you can request a free sample, apply for team grants, and register for 25% off at studica.com slash robots. For over 100 years, Kettering University has offered a better education because from day one, that education has been built on hands-on co-op learning. Kettering's impressive alumni network includes founders, presidents, CEOs, and front runners who have a reputation for transforming industries with their resolute leadership. Apply today at kettering.edu slash first. Okay, hello team, Runtime Terror. Now, I see you guys have this really complex robot, but let's start off by talking with your general game strategy and design philosophy this year, and why you chose to focus on only samples rather than doing both or only specimens. Yeah, so like you said, our game strategy this year was to be able to do just the samples at the highest level. That way we were able to specialize within our alliance and we don't slow ourselves down by being more of a generalist robot. So when we're able to specialize in our alliance, we can score just the samples from the submersible to the high bucket, while our alliance partner can focus on all of the specimen scoring side of things. And uh, this allows us to maximize our points overall and score the most points possible. That's great. Now another question I had is, why do you guys opt for the pivoting architecture rather than some sort of transfer system where both, both sides have had many teams go for them? Yeah, so having a pivoting architecture has many advantages over a transfer system where we can combine our intake and outtake into one mechanism where we simply intake and then pivot up to deposit in the high bucket. And another advantage of this is transfer systems can be quite slow and can reduce our cycle times. So when we have just one intake and outtake, just the pivoting takes up um, all of our time and it reduces our time down to very fast cycle times of just four to five seconds. Great, now let's just jump straight into this robot. I see you guys have just so much pocketed aluminum on this robot in general in your box, you have your whole drivetrain superstructure. Why don't you guys talk to me about all this aluminum superstructure and your drivetrain in general this season? Yeah, as you mentioned, we do use a lot of pocketed aluminum and that's because aluminum is really strong and is very light. Our robot is only around 22 pounds, which helps with our cycling time and also the strength of the aluminum helps when we have to play defense and it's very durable. For our drivetrain, we have a, we use a simple belted mechanism drive and we also use the, the new grip force mechanism wheels that are, help with acceleration and our speed. We also have sprung odometry wheels that for our autonomous. Great, now I think your drivetrain is nice and simple with that belted mechanism drivetrain which many teams offer. Something that caught my eye here is this a uh, sweeper sort of attachment. Why don't you guys walk me into uh, what that is and how that's helped you this year? Yeah, so we have a sweeper at the bottom of our robot. It basically sweeps un from underneath the submersible and clears the way for our intake so we can pick up samples more easily. Great, uh, thank you so much for that. Now, let's just talk about the main highlight of your robot, your box tube extension. Just, it's, it's just so fast and so elegant with its ISO grid pocketing. Just walk me through every component of it and what things you've learned from doing it this year. Yeah, so our box tube extension is our... Yeah, so our custom pivoting and extending box tube is the main system of our robot where it's fully custom um, pocketed aluminum, where we had a team 5064 from North Carolina helped us with the pocketing. And we use custom 3D printed bearing supported inserts to give us rigidity in all four directions of our box tube. And this is much, much lighter compared to linear slides and allows us to reach those really fast cycle times. Now, um, on top of this, we, many, Many issues that came up with our box tube were we were stringing. So stringing uh, with the box tube, you have to have cascade stringing. So we actually have four separate strings where um, they're cascade strung. So all of the, uh, the entire box tube extends all together at the same time. So each stage extends simultaneously. And another issue with 
uh, another difficulty with building box tube is these bearings need to be toleranced very well and need to fit our box tube very well so we really achieve that rigidity in all four directions. Great, no, I think your box tube is just so cool with all the pocketing and stuff like that. Um, so what exactly played into your, did you guys think of the box tube mechanism immediately when you chose that pivoting architecture or were you more considering pivoting linear slides versus box tube and you eventually decided on a box tube system? Yeah, so pivoting linear slides, transfer linear slides, all of that came through our brainstorming, but we decided on the box tube system because something like pivoting linear slides, first of all, it takes up a lot more space and also it's a lot heavier and also it doesn't give you rigidity in, in all four directions like the box tube. And so we decided on a box tube because it gives us the advantage of having no transfer and the speed of having no transfer, but also gives us rigidity and a lightweight robot. Great, now why don't you guys walk me through how your extension and pivot are powered. I see all of the motors are mounted at the bottom of your robot and I think it's quite cool how you package all of the extension and that center spool and the pivot axles. Just walk me through all of that and how it works. Yeah, so our extension motors are right here inside our robot and they go through this belt, which connects to our PTO system for hang and then also connects finally all the way through to this central axle. This central axle is coaxial with these go tubes and these go tubes are attached to these pulleys right here, which um, can actually pivot our full robot and this powers the spool in the center, which extends and retracts our robot. Great, now thank you so much for this box cube. I think it's really cool how fast and it's really contributed to those really tip top cycle times for your system. Now, let's just walk into that hang system. Why don't you guys walk me into uh, why you chose to do a PTO this year, what benefits it is, and just how your whole system works with that level two, then level three ascent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, first of all, in order to achieve the first level of ascent, we just have a simple system where we have two sprung hooks attached to servos. I just pull the robot up to the first climb, then, we also have our special PTO system, as you mentioned. So the main goal behind this was to uh, improve the torque when hanging, but we also wanted to keep speed when we're depositing and picking up samples like in a normal cycling time. So the way we did this was we had a servo linkage attached to a gear that drops down and physically connects all four of our drive tree motors to our two extension motors. And this helps give us enough power to pull the entire robot up to its third level ascent in under six seconds. Yeah, so it connects our, like you said, it connects our drivetrain to our box tube extension. So if you see, our box tube moves as our drivetrain moves forward. And that gives us the torque we need for that level three. Great, I think that's really cool how while you drive forward, it's able to retract the box tube. And I think that uh, shows how, how your system's able to function. Now, is there a reason you guys chose to do your PTO based hang rather than just using your regular extension motors? And why did you guys go across with this decision this year? Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned earlier, speed was a really big goal in our system this year. So in order to achieve speed, you can't have too many motors at one time. So we have two motors on our extension and that helps going really quickly in our cycling times. And we can maximize, maximize the amount of time for cycling enough samples during teleop. And then we, in order to combine six motors, it gives us, enough, we have the six motors for our hang, uh, our, make the, our hang really quick. So we can maximize the amount of samples placed and also have enough time for hang. Great, I think that's really cool how you guys are able to switch between low torque and high torque between teleop and hang. Now, uh, I, I see you guys mentioned that six motors thing. Uh, how did you guys decide upon that gear, optimal gear ratio for your hang? Did you guys have any issues with drawing too much current with six motors, blowing fuses, or anything of that sort? Or how did you guys have any iterations with that PTO in general? Yeah, so with our PTO, we've changed this gear ratio a few times because we wanted to have our PTO super fast to be able to reach it as fast, be able to reach level three as fast as possible. But at the same time, you have to balance that with having enough current draw from the battery not to like explode your robot. So we also um, need, so that's also another factor in wanting to have six drivetrain, uh, six motors, four drivetrain and two extension to pull up our robot because it's able to do it much faster and also helps with uh, battery and current draw systems. Great, now I think uh, let's just hop into your intake. I think it's very cool how you guys have this uh, very simple intake, you know, just two wheels off a servo. Uh, what, how did you guys come across this intake and how has it been for you so far this year? Yeah, so our intake 
uh, is a dual wheel active intake where it's very small, but it's also able to be an active intake and uh, is able to uh, retract the sample very, very quickly. And so we wanted the advantage of an active intake without like all the bulk. So we were able to settle on a design like this. Some of our iterations with the intake was previously we had a differential claw system, which also allowed us to score specimens, but we switched to an active intake to be much faster. Great, now I think it's very cool how as soon as that intake touched the sample, it automatically went down. Now one thing I, I, that caught my eye here is that the boxing system seemed to immediately retract when the intake, when the sample was in your intake. Is that a driver controlled feature or do you have any sensors or automation allowing you to do that? Yeah, so that's actually pretty cool where um, you can see the light actually coming from it where we have a color sensor in here that detects uh, the, detects that we have a sample and also detects if it's an aligned specific sample and um, retracts automatically, which saves time for the drivers. Great, I think that's it's really clear in your how fast your tell you have cycles are, just how much driver controlled optimizations you guys have spent. Now, I think we've done a great job in going over all of the mechanical components of your robot. What, uh, I see you guys have this really tiny camera here. Why don't you walk me into uh, what that camera is used for and how that functions in your autonomous period? Yeah, so in our autonomous period, we use Easy Open CV on the camera where we would draw blobs around the um, yellow samples. So we would group them all together and then we would kind of strafe to the best possible blob of yellow samples and just simply extend and take the sample. And yeah, it's pretty consistent. No, yeah, I think uh, one thing I'd like to ask is, I see you guys have put your camera, uh, two things caught my eye. One, is that it's tilted pretty far down. And I'm wondering if you're, how much of the submersible are you able to see? And is that specific to the camera? And two, why did you guys opt to put the camera on your robot rather than on your extension? I think I've seen both sides throughout this year. Some people doing it on the extension or some people doing it on the robot. What decisions kind of played into your choice right there? Yeah, so for number one, we're get able to get like a pretty good view of the sub, especially since this has a 160 degree um, FOV. But um, for number two, we actually used to place our camera over here and we had some problems getting like a good view of the sub. So, and we also hit it on the sub bar. So we decided to move it and mount it on the drivetrain over here. Great, no, I think it's, it's nice how you're able to see a lot of the sub with that 160 degree FOV. Now, just going into some general questions. I, I see you guys have these really fast tally up cycles that I think a lot of teams can take inspiration from, you know, almost 4.5, 5.5 second cycles. How have you guys achieved such fast cycles and like how has that evolved over time in that season? What have you done to get those cycle times really down? Yeah, so definitely took a lot of times to get to the sample uh, cycles. Sorry, um, but one of the biggest tips that helped our team uh, during our cycles was to start out slow. So we would basically set our entire drivetrain speed to half speed and practice our pathing going from the submersible to the basket. And then slowly we'd keep upping up that number and increasing the entire drivetrain speed so we could get more comfortable with it and more smooth with it. Great, I think, yeah, as you said, your pathing is really good. Every match, it's almost like you're able to hit those sample cycles really fast. Now, you guys have had an amazing year. I know you guys didn't qualify for the World Championships, but hopefully you guys are gonna compete in some off-season events. What future improvements are you looking to add to this already very impressive robot? Yeah, so one of the biggest future improvements is uh, currently all of these uh, inserts on the box tube are 3D printed, but what we would like to do is to make them metal. So that would probably definitely um, in increase the reliability and the consistency of our box tube mechanism. Oh yeah, thank you so much Runtime Terror for going over this amazing robot with so many mechanically and software complex things. And this is Rahul reporting from the Fun Robotics Network. Catch you next time on Behind the Box. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to stay up to date on future fun videos. For over 100 years, Kettering University has offered a better education because from day one, that education has been built on hands-on co-op learning. Kettering's impressive alumni network includes founders, presidents, CEOs, and frontrunners who have a reputation for transforming industries with their resolute leadership. Apply today at kettering.edu first.
Judica Robotics offers durable, polished, and anodized aluminum channels now available in several different color options to customize your robot at studica.com slash robots. No rough edges and a versatile hole pattern allow for positioning at multiple angles. Teams in the U.S., you can request a free sample, apply for team grants, and register for 25% off at studica.com slash robots.